I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples. And God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Today we celebrate and remember the saints who have blazed a trail of courage through time. We remember the tender touch of loved ones, the loyalty of friends, the kindness of strangers, the remarkable acts of fearless ones. Today we celebrate that God gives us new and true work, a life giving work. We are here where tears are wiped away, where a banquet has been set, where death has been swallowed up forever. Today we know that you are our God. We are your people. We are bound to you by the love of Jesus Christ. And we walk with you today, tomorrow, and every day.
You may be seated as I invite you into a time of prayer. <clears throat> Holy Lord, you are our God and we are your people. And we are grateful that you have claimed us as your own. You have set us in the company of saints, past and present, among those who have made bold witness to your goodness and your truth. We give you thanks for social ministries of the church and every ministry that heals, lifts up, and empowers. We praise you for a plentiful harvest and generous hearts. Send resources and the care of others to all those in need. We pray for those facing any crisis that causes suffering or sickness. We especially lift up Nick, Hunter, Larry, Kathy, and Aiden. Write the stories of your people deep into our hearts so that we may learn to trust you beyond our fears. Give us hearts and minds and spirits ready to trust and follow wherever your spirit leads, confident that you will not lead us beyond your loving embrace. Living God, we thank you for the gift of life eternal, and for all those who, having served you well, now rest from their labors. We thank you for all the saints remembered and forgotten, and for those dear souls most precious to us. Lord, we give you thanks for our newly baptized saints and those whose lives have inspired, challenged, loved, and taught us whom we lost this year. Maeve, Kennedy, Maxine, Marilyn, Pam, Leona, Megan, Cole, Doris, Jackie, Jen, Mary, Nancy, Clara, Grace, Kathy, Doris, David, Lorley. We thank you for the blessing of their life and love, and rejoice that for them, all is well. Mindful of all those who have gone on ahead of us, Teach us to follow their example to the best of our ability. Let us clearly recognize what it means to be called the children of God, and to know we are to be your saints, neither by our own inclination nor in our own strength, but simply by the call in the healing holiness of Christ Jesus our Savior. Amen. As we celebrate the saints in our lives, we now invite you to come forward and light a candle in celebration or memory of a loved one. Please use a long match for each family group. After lighting your candles, please extinguish it in the vase with water. May you feel at peace and blessed on this All Saints Sunday. Right. 
Please rise for the gospel. The gospel reading this morning comes from the New Testament book of John, chapter 11, verses 32 through 44. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how we loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and the stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, Already there is a stench because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise you, O Christ. Christ. <clears throat> Please be seated. Our must say I was deeply moved today, sitting in that chair, watching different individuals come up and light a candle in memory of a loved one or loved ones, people in our lives who have died. And it immediately brought to mind for me from this text the phrase, Lord, if you had been here. Lord, if you had been here, my loved one would not have died. Mary uttered this phrase, perhaps in grief. The text tells us that she went out to meet Jesus and fell down at his feet. Often that's interpreted to mean that she is praising, she is reverencing the Lord, but could it be she's just plain exhausted? Her brother's died, and she's upset. Messengers were sent to tell Jesus that his beloved friend, Lazarus, was ill, and he was to come at once. Perhaps, well, I don't believe, perhaps I believe, they knew Jesus' reputation as a healer. They knew that Jesus had the power to heal Lazarus, even as he lay on his deathbed. But instead of coming, Jesus delayed. Jesus delayed two days. And when Jesus finally arrives in Bethany to meet Martha and Mary, he is told, your friend is dead. And Mary is upset. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. How many of us have uttered that prayer? 
of longing, of hope, of trust. How many of us know the pain of losing somebody we love? Pain that never really heals. A loss that remains long after the death of our loved one. And what I find most amazing about this text, and perhaps why it's so appropriate for today on All Saints Sunday, is in the midst of all of this, Jesus is overcome with grief. Fully God, fully human. And we see and experience this human side of Jesus, who, as he sees the grief of Mary, as he sees the grief of those who loved Lazarus, openly weeping and mourning, he too is overcome. And in the shortest text in all of Scripture, the shortest sentence in all of Scripture, we learn Jesus wept. He is overcome with grief. He is overcome by what he sees and by what he experiences, and he openly weeps. I don't know about you, but that gives me comfort, knowing that our God knows our pain of loss and grief and anguish and all of the emotions that go with that, that our God experiences that too in this moment. But what I find most amazing about this text, I must admit to you, is as Jesus is there and, and experiencing all of this, the crowd extends an invitation to him. Lord, come and see. Isn't that the same invitation that Jesus has extended to one disciple after another? Come and see. And now the tables are turned, and in his grief, the crowd who is grieving invites Jesus to come and see. And in John's Gospel, there's no garden of Gethsemane. There's no agony in the garden. There's no coming to grips with death. In John's Gospel, this is that moment. And Jesus is invited to come to the tomb. Come and see your friend. Come and see death. Come and see pain. Come and see loss. Come and see the fate that awaits you. And Jesus, in this Good Friday moment, comes to the tomb, a cave, with a stone blocking the entrance. And in the face of death, what does Jesus do? Roll the stone away. Oh, Lord, Martha, and, and I'm looking at you, Jen, because your translation last week of the King James Bible said, He stinketh. The oh, Lord, He stinketh. He's dead. He's been dead for four days. He's already decomposing in the grave. Do you really want us to roll back the stone? Well, the text is making, I think, an emphatic. Yes, Lazarus is dead. It's been four days. In the Jewish belief, after three days, the soul leaves the body. There's no coming back. Lazarus isn't just dead. He's stone cold dead, and his body is decomposed. But in the face of death, Jesus speaks words of life. And in John's Gospel, if you know how it begins, we're just connecting the dots here. In John's Gospel, Jesus is the word Jesus is the incarnate word who becomes human and lives among us. Jesus is the incarnate world word who speaks creation into existence. He is the one in whom and through whom all things come into being. And in the face of death, Jesus speaks words of life. Lazarus, come out. Some translations will tell you this is a recipe resuscitate, I can't say the word, but they're, they're reviving it. No, that's not the case. He's dead. This is a resurrection. Lazarus, come out. And he comes out. But he's bound. He's wrapped in the burial shroud. His hands and his feet and his face are covered. He comes out. And what I most appreciate about this text is in this moment when Lazarus has been raised to life through the word, Jesus looks at the crowd and invites them into this new life. Unbind him and let him go. 
Jesus always extends the invitation to participate in ministry. Do you notice that? Jesus could act alone, but he never, if ever, does. Jesus always invites others, not only to come and see, but to come, join me in the building up of the kingdom of God here. Unbind him and let him go. Our adult Bible study group spent an hour on this text. And there are a lot of different ways we can unpack it. But one of the things that stands out to me is in this in this text, the invitation to us, to those who hear, to those who hear it proclaim, to those who read it, is unbind him. How might God be inviting you to unbind what's in your life that's preventing others to experience the risen Christ? Because the beauty of it all is we are called to experience the risen Christ now in our everyday lives, not just when we die. And, and that's being made evident in the text when I am the resurrection and the life is standing right before Lazarus himself, and we're being asked to unbind all that hinders our access to the living Christ. What is it, I wonder, in your life that's preventing you from living into that reality? Or, or even more importantly, what is happening in your life now that might be preventing others from accessing a living Christ. Is it judge judgment? Is it pointing fingers? Casting blame? I don't know, but I'm challenged by that. And then I wonder, as a community of faith, what is it in our midst that is preventing us from following the risen Christ into the future we are being invited into. I know a little of the history here. Perhaps it could be lingering resentments, power grabs, divisions over decisions that were made or not made. So how might the living Christ be inviting all of us now into moving into the future, trusting that the one who promises to be with us always is leading the way. I place my trust in Christ. I pr place my trust in the one who brings life out of death. I place my trust in the one who promises to be with us always, even when we look at these candles and cry out, Lord, if you had been here, my loved one would not have died. We will receive the offer.
outside looking in. This is where the place begins. When you're hungry or thirsty, with nothing left to give, all the shame that we were in. Just when all the world seemed lost, the hope in the door for us, he said, Come to the table. Come join the sinners who have been redeemed. Take your place beside the Savior.
God invites us to his table, into his future where he makes a home among us and makes all things new. We are called and chosen, embraced by God where tears, mourning, crying, pain, and even death will be no more. Amen. Please rise with us. Share the good news.